All right, what's going on, guys? It's Chris, Jimmy. We're live from Rental with Jeff Turner, Real Estate Tech South. Hopefully, you guys can see the other view. We got a huge room, casino party going on. No, but what I'm getting at is what I find is, in, like, in, in, you know, in the software space. No, right? your values aren't your values until they cost you something. Yeah, right. And so, a lot of people talk about values. They talk about what they believe in and all this stuff. But until they cost you something, they're not really your values. They're nice things. You like to talk about them. No words on the wall, no signs. But that's not it. What What do you do when the rubber meets the road? What do you do when it gets tough? What do you do when it when you've got to make that tough decision? Those are your values. Now, and I think and I think that the thing that I, I take away from that, guys, as you're watching right now uh, live, is you have to think about your own business in the positions you've been at historically or just even recently. You know, what what are those scenarios that Jeff's talking about here? That you ask me serious questions. In the middle of these audio all I have is serious questions. That's all I got from notes. Come on. No, but really quickly, there's 53 people who just sat there 15 minutes. Audio issues we're yes. good now, so thank you guys for watching. Thank you very much. Do you want to jump in here? We're talking about leadership. All right. No, but what else? Is he like this all? Leadership yes. class. <laughs> yeah, I actually just read that book. It's really good. good. Yeah, Simon Sinek. Yeah, I just wrote it. Takeaway: Simon Sinek, the guy that wrote Star with the Line. Yeah. So he just put out a great new book called Leaders Eat Last. So yeah. Great. Yeah. The one thing I'd say from, from that book and something that you're echoing right here is this idea that a leader's responsibility isn't to take credit. It isn't becoming the sort of talking head of the organization. Rather, it's to create an environment where people actually want to follow. Them. Right? And what happens is when you do that, like the leader selfishly gets the results they want to get. Well, so things. my opinion is in the best organizations, people should be asking themselves, so what the heck is the leader doing? They should be thinking, I'm doing this is work. us. Yeah. This is us. We're doing this. We're making this happen. Yep. The leader is, is is there to motivate, he's there to encourage, he's there to reward, he's there to, to set the path, he's there to blaze the trail, he's there to do all these other things. Leader doesn't have to be this charismatic person, yeah. but they have to have a very clearly articulated understanding of where they want to see the organization. Outside of real estate, yeah. great leaders you love, that you follow, that you are like, use a sort of inspiration, if you will. Wow. Um, well, I mean, the obvious one for me is Steve Jobs. I mean, you met him too. No, I met him, so I, I actually had a chance to, to thank him because... I'm one of those guys who, in 1984, bought one of those first Macs. I've got it gutted. It sits on, on my bookshelf. All of the signatures of the original gravers of the Mac are engraved on the inside of this thing. And so that Mac really changed my life. I, it's what caused me to leave psychology. It's what caused me to decide to go into business. And so I did. I got a chance to thank him personally at a Mac where I literally ran into him randomly, went up to him and him. Thank you so much for changing my life. Yeah, because it really did change my life. And I, I think you get confused about values. Um, Can I say something? Yeah. So one thing I, I agree with, realtors ask us for all the tricks in the book. We think they probably just need a better computer and more bandwidth on their Wi-Fi. You know what I'm saying? Like, your laptop, you use it all day, every day, and you're going to cheap out. Right, and go 799 HP instead of 1199 Mac. The best takeaway I could ever give anyone is that's the Well, we could we could be in that debate all day long. Seriously. <laughs> all right. Don't worry. I have no idea. What did you <laughs> so, just do? No, he's giving a, he's giving a tech savvy agent tip right there. Yeah. Sorry. So Steve Jobs. You no, never got on the Steve Jobs. Yeah. But, but the whole point. So Steve Jobs, if you read the book, his biography, he was a complete asshole. Frankly. Right. Yeah. So I, right, right. this is where people get confused on values. Values aren't always these positive things. They're your authentic actions. They're who you really are. That's what you really want. Companies would do better to simply articulate clearly. This is who we are. This yeah. is what we believe. And be Even if it's it. unpopular. Even if it's unpopular. Yeah. Yeah. And attract the people who are attracted to those same values. And that's what Steve Jobs did. And then I think that for me, the takeaway, guys, here in real estate especially is the willingness to say you're not my client, I think that's a defining characteristic. If you look at Zappos as an example, right? Yeah. Zappos doesn't necessarily draw lines and say like, you're not our, my client, but for their employees, right? Yeah. They certainly do. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We we did the same thing. So my previous business career was in the newspaper industry, and so I had a company. In fact, I literally got a tweet 
literally seconds ago from someone who used to work with me who is now a multi-million-dollar real estate agent. He goes, are you the same Jeff Perry? <laughs> like, yeah, that's me. Um, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but what we did is when we hired, yeah. we had our values as one of the main components. You, you had to address those values clearly and articulate. We put you through a values evaluation. Yeah. If you didn't line up with those values, you didn't get hired. Yeah. It was just part of the process. And, that, and that's something I think, we, for me, a takeaway, just to jump the phone off of here, but for, for a takeaway, the idea, we, I, I know people here right now, clients were running into Julie Farmer and Michelle Herndon who are going through the process right now of hiring a new assistant. And what they're looking for, as you're describing, is the technical skills. Do you know how to use Excel? Do you know how to use Google Drive? Whatever it is. And what Jeff's really getting at here is like, if you don't have a set of values that you can hire or fire off of, then you really don't you have You can value. train everything else. Exactly. I can train somebody. Come on, how difficult is it to use Google Drive? How difficult is it to use any piece of technology? Yeah. You can train all of that. You cannot train those innate values that make somebody who they are, that give them their work ethic, that give them their yeah. sense of, of purpose. You can't train that. Yeah. Well, talk to us about... Well, a lot of companies, I don't know if people can hear me, but just the idea that at a lot of companies, you have to actually... You know they make you fill out that shit where it's like if you found a hundred dollar bill and you knew no one would find out, like there's a reason huge companies do that. Yeah, there is. Right? It, yeah, it, absolutely. It, that, that's that's like a way to at scale. But, try unfor- to figure out but unfortunately, here's out. the problem with most big companies: it stops at that process. The, the values end up being these words on a screen, but they don't end up being that filter that causes someone to be evaluated ongoing. And I think that's the difference between a company that's actually living those values and a company where the values are simply window dressing more than yeah. anything else. It's, it's a box they tick in the hiring process as opposed to this is how we're going to make decisions ongoing well, who, about who, how who we hire. Said, who said your brand is what people say when they're I have no idea. We can say that to you. No, I can't <laughs> take that one. That one's known. But that, that's the idea. It's like, like uh, Linda Davis. What's yeah. her quote? Get the quote. Oh God! If you have a shitty oh, business, if you have it won't help. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. it's her fa- famous <laughs> Inman Connect yeah. 2007 yeah. up on yeah. stage at Blog World. Well, yeah. talk, talk. This, this is something I think you, you, you've written about, you've talked about. Yeah. Like, hey, real quick, real quick. Plug his blog, JeffFerner.info. Yeah. The only dot info well, I know. Well, Jeff, it's, it's JeffFerner.com too. I'm just not smart enough <laughs> to know how to convert it so that I don't lose all of that. JeffFerner.info. Um, yeah, no, I, I subscribe. It's, all, it's great stuff. But the, the, the thing that you mentioned, Steve Jobs, right? Yeah. And when I think of Steve Jobs, I think of somebody who really, is, and you wrote an article about this, not related to Steve Jobs, but like did the hard things, right? He talks about this a lot, like this idea of like doing the hard things. So in real estate, so what are those hard decisions or hard things that you think we're not doing that we potentially could be doing that? you know, ultimately move in the right direction. Well, so the hard things are all of those um, high-touch stuff that people think, for example, they think social media was replaced. place. Yeah. That social media never replaced. I mean, you look at Heather presenting all of that NAR research stuff. Yeah. What's the stuff, the communication stuff that the consumer really values? Yeah. What was it? I don't know. It was highly customized communication. Yeah. The stuff that you can't just press a button and yeah. send out to a thousand people and yeah. automate. It was that very... It was picking up the phone yeah. and talking to them, yeah. regardless of their preferred method of communication. And so I, I think, for whatever reason, everybody's constantly looking for the silver bullet. They're looking for this magic pill yeah. Yeah. that's going to do something. But it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Well, I think, and for me, I think that the, 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 the challenge we have in real estate is, as you just described, when you get away from not just the basics, right? Because I don't think these things are necessarily basic to a great business. But I think they actually need to be trained and need to be reinforced. But if you get back to the things that actually have an impact, right? And when we talk about automation, um, you guys probably are familiar with things like Buffer and Mood Suite and other applications right. out there that can. And this is a question we get all the time: How do I automate my social media posts, right? And th- this is not a, a dumb question. It's not a wrong question. I'm, actually, let me correct that. It's not a dumb question, but it's the wrong question we're asking, right? Right. It's not about the tool. It's not about automation. It's about how do you? I use Buffer. Yeah. But I'm I'm not setting up an automatic drip into Buffer. I use Buffer um, to spread out the stuff that I take the time to read and curate myself, yep. as opposed to. And I see this all the time, and you can you can tell who's doing it. They've obviously set up an RSS feed for something else. Yeah. And dude, they're just they're tweeting out stuff nonstop. And it's clear they've not read any of this stuff. Yeah. 
Well, we said we, we said this before on the show, right? We said the hell with quantity. Let's you know pitch the quality right. angle, right? Because I think that's what we run into with social media in particular, as the camera shaking as our phrase is going to collapse altogether. But this idea that like the, the, if so you buffer app .com. Yeah, we, we weren't plugging it, but we were just saying. No, like, it's a great technology if you use the right. Here's here's the reason buffer's great. People say they can't hear. Because <laughs> if Jeff wakes up every day at 7 a.m. Yes. And he reads all of his favorite shit from 7 to 9. He doesn't want to share 12 or 14 articles on Facebook or Twitter in that two-hour period. So for him, it's basically timing the shit he would have shared anyway, and you're just adhering to the etiquette of social, which is you don't share 10 articles even if you do read them all. Right, so I mean, buffer for you. Exactly. You. That's it. That's for, the, it. for the record, guys, our viewers are actually going up. So this is, this is nice. a good sign. Yeah, I'm glad you're there. Uh, yeah, I got you. Uh, let's let's talk about innovation for a moment. Okay. Because I think innovation... Define real innovation. Well, I'm not going to have you define it. No, you define it. Well, the way I define innovation for me... And that's a, that's a way for me to basically say, let me think about this for a moment here. Because in real estate, I think of innovation as something that, something that, I think it's something that changes the paradigm that actually has a meaningful impact, right? In okay. the sense, in the sense that, like, if I was like, taking Uber for example. Like when we think about disruption and we think about innovation, Uber didn't disrupt or change what was already happening, right? It was people driving around people. What that's Uber. Fine. Yeah, what Uber did, if you guys haven't are familiar with Uber, it's a phenomenal company to follow. What Uber did was they basically took out all the bureaucracy, all the complication, all the things that basically made the process miserable for everybody involved in it. The taxi driver, a taxi. yep, it's getting a right. taxi to actually the driver, and they removed all of that. So when I think of innovation, I think of taking a, you could do it in two different ways, but taking the existing problem and approaching it in a way that actually has a meaningful impact. To me, that's a very raw example of innovation. And again, Uber is a brilliant company because they executed it, but it's not a like a this unbelievable idea like they're like they're curing polio or something. It's right. just a connecting consumers to taxi drivers through their application. And I think it's a brilliant idea. I agree, and, and I would agree that that's probably innovation. I think I think most of what we call innovation in the real estate industry is really just iteration. It's really just an evolution. It, most of the time, it's just an improved means to the exact same ends. You're not, yeah. you're really not getting a better end. And I, I think innovation, purely in its in its purest form, actually gets you to a better end. There's there's something different that happens at the end of that process. Yeah. And that's that's what I'm not seeing tons of. Yeah. Uh, in real estate. In real estate. Well, in, this is something in software, right? In software, innovation isn't this long drawn out process. Oftentimes, it sprints. Right? We sort of sprint to an end goal. Like you talk about Apple early in the in the biography, the early days of Apple, they had they had like this crazy two month sprint to ship the first Mac, the, the second Mac. It was like, you know, it was it it wasn't perfect when they released it, right. but they had to get it out the door. But there was this sort of sprint that was involved. So this is something I think that anybody who's watching the show right now may struggle with is like when you're in that normal normal daily grind of like managing your business, right? When do you find time to actually have these sort of innovative moments? Well, so, but this is where I think we get, I want to I want to try and shift this conversation away from conversations that are around technology yeah. relative yeah. to innovation, because I think real estate agents' opportunity for innovation come in, in other areas. Yeah. We heard it again from the stage today, and if you're not at Retso, I apologize that I'm making all of these references, but... Where's the innovation in customer service? Where's the innovation in how we're meaningfully communicating, connecting with consumers? Yeah. I'd rather see real estate agents focus on not just a there. faster website, not just a faster website, yeah. not just you know what's the can I go create an app or do I need a better mobile fill in the blank? Yeah, I mean all that's great and I'm sure it's a great tool, but in the end. What are consumers really looking for? Yeah. Consumers are looking for an experience. They're looking for somebody who can hand them something that they they go, you know, at the end of it, I feel good about yeah. it. And that doesn't have a thing to do with technology. Well, it, it, you know, and, and I'm, I'm going to give you a technology analogy, but, but, I, but I agree with what you're saying there. But I think that in technology, if you deliver a product on time, under budget, right, it, if nobody likes it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, yeah. Can so, yeah. If you find me the perfect house on the perfect street in the perfect neighborhood, I'll never send you a referral if you don't call me back quickly and respond to my emails the same day. Yeah. 
That's the same concept, right? Well, no, it's similar, yeah. Well, talk about that for a second here, from the experience standpoint, because this is something that's just... It depends on the expectation you set with the consumer. Well, start there. Start there. So, average real estate agent, right? They get a call from a sign call, lead comes in, right? They approach this as a sales process, right? right? So it's all about showing all the great things they're going to do for them, how it's going to be an amazing experience. How do you, during that initial sales process, set yourself apart by doing what you're describing here? Setting the expectations up so that they not only know what to expect, but when you deliver it, they feel like they got real value out of it. Listen, so again, I'm not a real estate agent. Yeah. I've never sold a house. I can't speak to that exact process. I know what works for me in the yep. sales process, and that's asking questions, shutting up, and listening. You know, the goal here is to find out what exactly the consumer is looking for. And so in, in my business, it's finding out what my clients want. What do they want? Can I solve that problem for them? Yep. Can I articulate to them how it is I'm going to solve that problem and set the expectation of what it is that I'm going to deliver? Mm -hmm. So I don't believe that process is any different for real estate versus any for real business. estate versus yeah. any business, there has to be there has to be this moment yeah. where you you just you're there to do one thing one thing only and that's to listen and yeah. understand what it is they want. Oh no! So I've got a I've got a line. No, there is a story. So I you know part of my process and I'm not I don't know that I'm typical or atypical in how I prepare for presentations, but I typically don't finish my present, like, I've got a 9 o'clock keynote tomorrow morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to be up. I have all my slides done. I just don't know what order I'm going to put them in, and I don't know what story I'm going to tell yet, because even stuff I learned today, this, something here may end up in my presentation tomorrow morning. Maybe. Um, <laughs> gar no, guarantee, a conversation I saw on Twitter today will end up in yeah. my presentation tomorrow morning. And so Jim Duncan just this sort of innocuous tweet. He goes, I just talked someone out of buying a house today. Hashtag success. So for me, that speaks very, very specifically to customer experience. That speaks, one, to his integrity. It speaks to, but it also speaks to uh, something that's not talked about enough in the real estate. We are all about, we celebrate top salespeople. Yeah. We celebrate numbers. We celebrate all this. We don't celebrate enough the fact that a realtor said, I helped somebody decide not to buy a house today. In, in the end, that is as valuable to Jim in terms of future potential business, in terms of, of satisfaction in what he did, in terms of how that consumer is going to feel about him when yeah. somebody says, who should you choose as your realtor? Yeah. It's as important as finding the right house on the right street at the right price. Yeah. And maybe more so, because it, it it establishes a fiduciary relationship where my I am putting your needs ahead of mine, which and, is what is that expected. Is, right? That's what that's what the consumer expects, I believe. Yeah. You, you want me to repeat that? Quote? Yeah, so so I'm translating for Chris, guys. This is just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Yes makes you wealthy financially. No makes you wealthy emotionally. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Money. Hold on a second. <laughs> For the record, I'm I'm just quoting Chris. That's not my no, quote. There's, 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 that mean. there's there's equity in no. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The, Jim Duncan saying no but is going to not ultimately make you rich. Saying no? Yeah. It does. But it's emotional. They're not they're not mutually exclusive. That, so we're so talking about immediately. Yes. Yeah. There's no financial well, I, gain. I would, I would think, I would think, if I were going to tweak your quote, it'd be, yes makes you money now, no makes you wealthy. If I were to tweak the quote, I would make it. Yes means yes, no means no. I can't yeah. say that. I can't say that. All right. No, but here's one thing yes. we do at Curator, and you've probably done this with Zeke. Yes. You've probably taken pride in denying someone from working with you, and I just don't see that realtors probably have that mindset. That you need so, to be as excited about a no I, as you are about a yes. I. So I think it's a blanket statement to say realtors don't. I think the perception on the consumer side is that realtors don't. Yeah. But I know in the circles that we hang out in, in the circles that we all hang out in. Where we're at today. Lori, I guarantee does. Lisa, I guarantee does. Brad, I guarantee does. I guarantee these people. Michael Gonzalez does. does. And so there's this. 
there's a perception and there's a reality. I think successful agents understand how to say no and when to say no, and they do it very, very effectively. This is something I've been thinking about. A little bit off topic here. I love the quote, by the way. Ask questions and then shut up and listen. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Thank Mike and Andrea and Dave. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is off. Topic. I'm gonna lose my voice. If I lose my voice before tomorrow morning, Brad will kill both of them. So the question is this: is something I haven't heard discussed a lot. We talk about leadership. We talk about inspiring your agents, right? Right. When we compare them to other organizations like Zappos or Apple or Harley Davidson or Costco's, listen, I love Costco's. I think they're a phenomenal company. What we don't talk about is the fact that there isn't an inherent conflict amongst Costco's employees in the sense that Costco employees are all working for Costco's they're all serving the customer but in real estate for brokerages and for teams oftentimes there can be like the same agent serving the same area so how or just advice to speak to that because I think that's something that's just not talked about enough how do you inspire even in the competitive environment where it is maybe in their short-term best interest to work against each other but you know and I know Chris knows it's in their best interest as a company and as a as a brand to collectively work together. Big question, off topic, but I want to get your thoughts on it. Well, so are, are you saying that because agents sometimes compete for the same clients? I'm saying that at a at a brokerage level, the amount of sharing and collaboration that happens is a fraction of what happens at the national level. For the same, and you know, in the forums, we all belong to forums. Just been a forum guy forever. We started a tech support group. What you see is the people's willingness to share is because they don't feel like they're giving away their trade secrets. Right. So how does a leader from a team, from a brokerage, instill some type of environment where people are willing to sort of break through that, I think, so also? That gets led from the top. Is the broker sharing? Is the broker willing to display these characteristics? You know, for me, this stuff is really, really very basic. Yeah. If the broker is displaying those characteristics, those characteristics are displayed by the agents that work underneath them. If the broker is holding things in, holding things back, not sharing, not doing those things, those things are going to be displayed by the people working. Just agents are 1099 employees. That's often used as an excuse why certain things can't be done in the real estate industry. Yeah, and that's crap. Yeah. Um, nobody is forced to work anywhere in the United States. Everybody, regardless of their tax status, is free to get up and go anywhere they want. The objective for the real estate industry is to create the environment that says, we're not competing with each other. We are on the same team. We are accomplishing the same goal. Because I think in reality, agents inside of the same office aren't often competing with one another. Mm -hmm. Not when you look at the numbers. All of the numbers speak yeah. to something completely different. If if 80%, and so it real satisfies our numbers yeah. on the back end, more than 80% of listings yeah. come from referrals or from uh, somebody having done business previously. Yeah. In our study, it was 70 some percent. Across the board, every study shows that. If that's true, I'm not referring two people in the same office, and they're not competing against each other for those listings. There's a small percentage of that stuff that ends up being competed. If the numbers bear out, so I don't know what the reality is inside of a small office and how much of this business is being competed on head to head. Combine that with the other number that's yeah. constant. Yeah. Seventy percent of people choose the first agent they talk to. Yeah. Who's competing? And that goes back to what you just mentioned earlier, which is the basics, right? Right. Like calling people back, answering your email, right? Picking up the phone when they call. And Chris actually talks about this a lot. He gives an Emerald example and other chef examples, which is in other industries, like 37 Signals, a company that I really love and admire. Yeah, I know I'm facing it. And these companies openly and willingly share information that would be perceived to be against their best interest. It's like they're perceived right. trade secrets, right? But they're sharing it with the world. And what that does, in my opinion, and I want to get you guys' thoughts on this, like it establishes you, at least from a marketing perspective, not from the internal perspective, but it establishes you as an expert, right? If you're willing to openly share, because I want to shift the marketing here for a moment, if you're willing to openly share information, regard, like I'm talking like, because this is actually something I hear all the time, Jack, which is like, I don't want to give my listing appreciation, appreciation, appreciation away, because it's like my, it's like my, it's my cut, my advantage, it's my, it's my advantage, right? Right, as if it presents itself. <laughs> so like, we hear that, but you know, from, from a marketing perspective right now, I feel like we are just, it, I guess my question is this, can we course correct, right? Because if you, if we've seen in the forums, 
you know, all about SEO, all about the sort of getting, yes. getting more eyes. Can we course correct this yes. way? And how? <laughs> because the follow I say. So, we're dealing, if you look across this room of agents right here, yeah. we're dealing with a whole bunch of people who, my bet is, probably don't need much course correction. The course correction, in my mind, happens at the local broker level. It happens where the rubber meets the road, where somebody can make the determination. This person either is or is not a good real estate agent. They either take this seriously or they don't take it seriously. Yep. At some point, brokers have to step up and say, I'm not going to accept agents who don't meet a certain standard. That's the way to course correct. Yeah. What's the standard? You, you tell me. Let the bro let the local broker decide. No, I th I, 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 I think I'd be I'd be disqualified at that point. No, no, no. I know college degrees don't make any difference at all. It's about it's about it's about customer yeah. experience. Yeah. What's the customer experience well, you're delivering? T like we the when I think of like customer experience here, because I want I want to talk about that for a moment because I think ultimately, yeah. When we talk about customer experience, right, we try to overcomplicate it oftentimes, right? We try to, we talk, there's lots of threads in the group right now about, like, what's the best uh, gift to give after closing, right? But what do you think the basic things right now that agents are either not doing consistently or simply just not doing at all that they can start doing? And then they, may, they may already know the answer to this, but to hear it again, I think would be really useful. So... I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a number. I'm gonna speak from my own personal experiences because it's all I got. Yeah. We did um, at Real Satisfy our own internal customer satisfaction survey, and we asked this question: How many of you thank your customers for having taken the time to complete a survey? What percentage of them yeah. thank their customers? after they completed it? After they, their customer took the time yeah. to, to, to complete a detailed survey. Yeah. Only 40% said they thanked them. Not not give them a gift. Yeah. Literally just said thank in you. In any form of communication. In any form of communication. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, if we can just get back to those basics, pick up the phone. Yeah. Say thank you. Do the courtesies. And again, I we my bet is everybody listening to this show is the choir as well. Yeah. The the people who aren't doing this aren't well, listening right well, now. Well, no, no, no. You know that this that, that that's actually I think. With our audience right now who's watching, everyone here, when you is this, there's something that happens in real estate. When you get really busy, right, with what's happening right now, I mean, you talk about time management a lot, but like, when you get really busy, you almost stop doing the things that actually matter, and you start just focusing on the problem that's literally right in front of you, right? It, this is this is something I think in real estate right now. I think this we heard Gary Vaynerchuk talk about this. We had um, Lee Brown talked about this. Uh, David Acosta talked about this. Like this idea of like, if you don't control your calendar, somebody else will. Right. And this uh, this concept of what Jeff's talking about, which is this is like the little big things, Tom Peter style, right? right? Focusing on the things that actually matter. But in order to achieve that, you've got to have control over your business. You can't just be running around just dealing, putting out fires constantly. Um, so that. That, for me, at least, is something I want you to talk about right now, which is this idea, and you actually quoted, and Chris and I have never read this book, Meditation by Marcus Aurelius. Oh, you better read Meditation. <laughs> this is way above our pay grade, but uh, you quoted him, right, in one of your blog posts I wrote. I want everyone here to listen to this, because this to me is... I, I think you wrote it down, because... You know. it, I, don't, I don't need you to read the quote. We actually probably have the quote here. Cause I, got, I, got, I actually do have notes, guys. Um, let's see here. Yeah, here we go. This is... Um, this is from Marcus Aurelius and Meditations. I don't think I actually have the exact quote, but what he's talking about, let's just sort of frame the, frame this this uh, this point you're making, is that even during that time, when right. there was no social media, no social media, it's 180 AD. Yeah, right. I mean, there's no radio, and there's, there's trees <laughs> and tablets and rocks. Yeah, exactly. Right. The real tablets. But even during that time, the point was that. It was easy to get distracted and not focus on the things that matter. Yep. And so his writings, if you've never read uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, it's, it's really, one, it's easy. It's an easy read. So it's not a bug your pay grade you're, you're, by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. yeah, it's not a bug your pay grade by any stretch of imagination. But it really is lessons on how to focus, how to, how to get things done, how yep. to make certain that you're not being pulled away from the things that matter. 
and again, I, I, we've talked about this a lot um, in a lot of the companies that work with. Agents do get very transactionally focused, and they, they slip from one thing to the next. But the really good agents find a way to make certain that they're still doing the things that matter. They find a way to say thank you. They find a way to consistently communicate post-sale. Yeah. They find a way to make certain that their customers understand how they feel about them, and that they create relationships that are meaningful and yeah. real. These aren't just transaction-based relationships. Um, if, if that weren't true, yeah, 80% of the population wasn't be getting listings based on referrals. They would go out. Exactly. They could go out well, out. it's it's really interesting when you when I hear you say that because when I when, when I think about um, you know the typical agent day as Jeff just mentioned that go from transaction to transaction. Th this is actually a really common problem I think that we experience when we get really busy. And I just feel like at this point right now in with all of the distractions and all the shiny objects that are out there, we have to make a concerted effort to slow down and do a hell of a lot less. One bit of advice Jeff actually gave me many, many years ago, he probably forgot even telling me, was take Sundays off, right? You remember, he actually sent me a message saying, take Sundays off. And what was interesting about that, because I think in real estate, we celebrate, we work 90 hours a week, right? But there's a difference between... The American culture celebrates. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just insanity, because you know what? There's a difference between being productive and actually working a shit little hours. Right. Right? And so for us right now, who are everyone who's watching the show right now, I think the most important thing we could take away from just the point about letting these distractions take over your life is if you are opening your email first thing in the morning, if you are checking your Facebook messages, if you're checking your Twitter stream, if you are then like checking your text message on your phone, you are letting your day control you versus you actually controlling your day. Uh, I was actually paying attention to a couple of the other conference streams today as yeah. well. I think one of the things, and if Tom Ferry's listening, just know that I was actually paying attention a little bit this morning. Um, they were talking about get a better morning routine. Yeah. You know, I, I know in my personal life, right? Yeah. If I, if I don't start my days with a certain, you know, yeah. sort of schedule, if I don't do that same thing every morning, my whole day is thrown off. It, it takes me till noon to get back on track and to, and to begin focusing yeah. the way I want. So it, it doesn't matter what that routine is, but it needs to be something predictable. It needs to be something that when you get up in the morning, this is what you're going to do. And it can't just be clearing your inbox because, you know, it can be if it's that and then you know exactly what you're going to do yeah. next. Otherwise, you're going to spend, if you're, if you're as busy as you say you are, your inbox isn't going to get clean. Yeah. You're going to get another email in during that time and something's going to happen to distract you from it. There has to be a routine. Let's let's talk about marketing here because we got we got I don't know how much time we have left in the show. We're gonna let it run. We're not gonna let Jeff lose his voice for tomorrow's show. But let's talk about ownership here because this is actually something you've talked about a little bit in some of the blogs you've written about. And this is something because this is actually a topic that comes up really often. It's like, do you, should I own my content? Right. Right. right? And th there's um, and we're seeing we're seeing the impact of the rented space model, Absolutely. right? So if you see anybody who right now who's been big into Facebook like myself... Well, it's one of the things, so Chris and I joke all the time that we don't agree on things, and we don't on a yeah. lot of things. And one of the things... <laughs> Where is Chris, by the way? One of the things we definitely <laughs> don't... One of the things we definitely don't agree on, Chris likes to say all the time, Facebook is the internet. Facebook is not That's, the internet. We can start trash talking Chris now because he's gone. <laughs> Facebook's not the internet, it and you don't want it to be the internet. Um, they change the rules all the time. You're captive to their rules. You're captive to everything they're doing. Yep. Own your content. Have your own blog. Have your own place where you're hosting this stuff. Own your content. It, it's just, it, it's one of those things that just seems so blatantly obvious that you shouldn't have to say it. And yet, it, it feels like this mantra that needs to be preached. Yeah, it, ne it needs to be preached. And the thing I, I, I echo in that sense is what you're saying isn't that you don't leverage the other tools out there. No, no, no. Yeah. You got to have a home for the stuff that you actually own. Because what happens is, if you guys look back ten years, right from from today, Facebook was literally just created at the time. Maybe Friendster was popular, right? Before then, it was like Bebo, right? Right. <laughs> it's like, what and, was and it? Facebook could die. I mean, the notion that Facebook can't die, that it's too big to fail, is ridiculous. Yeah. The the thing that Facebook is, and Facebook has become this. Um, it's a pay-to-play network, right? That's what it is. Absolutely. It's, it's a it's a they have a. Uh, obligation to their shareholders to make money, and their only way to make money is through advertising dollars. They'll never charge your user because right. they'll be master vaults. So they have to appease businesses. So as a result, all the effort, you pointed this out in your article actually, all the effort that we spend to build likes 
is meaningless unless we actually put some advertising dollars to it. It's not a bad so, thing. It's just the reality, right? No, it, that's the reality. So the, the objective here is, at the end of the day, when everything's said and done, and I'm directing, I got one. I'm gonna have one opportunity to get somebody to go someplace. Where do I want them to go? Yeah. I want them to go someplace that when they go there, I I can actually hold on to them. Yeah. And where is that? It's not Facebook. I'm yeah. Sorry, it's just not. Because then within Facebook, you guys have to realize you're competing against grandma. You're competing against advertisements. You're competing against all these other things that. The average consumer experiences, which is all these distractions. Right. You're so, competing against my wife's charity. You do not want to do that. Yeah, exactly. The picture of like, you know, someone helping a, a, a child in need versus like your shitty Facebook post. It's a tough gig to follow, right? It's tough yeah, it to is. follow. It absolutely um, is. Not, not all Facebook posts are shitty. I don't want to no, no. categorize it, but. Uh, I miss. <laughs> oh, I, I trashed you. Let yeah. Me go. Uh, go, yeah. <laughs> so let's let's talk about digging deep here for a moment. Now, there's only a few more questions, and Chris, I'm not going to even ask you to pull your opinion on this, but well, you just keep leaving, so I'm like. Well, I, it's hard for me to be part of the show. I'm part of the show. Here, I'll stand behind you. So yeah, no, we're going to get you Jeff switch? on the show. Again. Uh, we will. Okay. All right. <laughs> the the hook versus the bait, right? Or the hook versus the brilliant meat. I'm not probably not even quoting it properly. But this idea that we are, you know, and Chris and I talk about the importance of headlines, right? We talk about the importance of headlines, which they are important. But what happens is when the headlines or the hook becomes the end all, right? right. So in real estate right now, and you've seen this in the forums, sure. where like everyone's looking to game Google, right? We see this all the time. How do we game Google? Like what's the right keywords? What's right. the right keyword? Like really stupid stuff like keyword density, which is just sure. has been well documented to be just irrelevant for the better right. part of a decade. When you talk about owning your content, yes, right. I want you to talk about this idea of really having meat, right? Because this is actually something that people are like. I'm gonna post up to my blog. Jeff's telling me to post my blog, but talk about like what you should actually be writing about. I am, actually, I am never ever going to tell a real estate agent what to write about. No, no, that is not, never not, gonna not, not specifically. Not specifically. No, 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 you should write about what matters to you. You should write That's about things for. that are important yeah. to you. You should write about things that are important to your clients. I don't know what that is. Yeah, and what's, I'm, what's of value to your community? And that, what do they want to know? See, these are all things they should be writing about, which is my no, point. Or not writing about it at all. And maybe just simply Start doing with, the job that they're supposed to be doing, which is going out to local t-ball games or local meetings and meeting people face-to-face -face and doing the things in their community yeah. that really make a difference. Jay Baer wrote an awesome book called Utility. And one of the things he profiles in the book is a, a pool company that was basically going under because the economy was crashing in 2008 and they had basically no business. And the, and the guy who run the pool company, right, who had no technology experience, had no writing experience, basically said, I'm going to create a blog and I'm going to tell every person about everything that's involved with every question I got. Right? So Jeff's not going to tell, say, say here and say, you guys should write an article about the 10 things you must do in your local neighborhood. But what I'm going to say is, if you actually commit yourself to marketing your, your brand line, you should start at the very minimum with what are your common questions you get from your customers. And at least put that in a form in which people can consume that information. If that's what you can do, not everyone can blog, not everyone can write, not everyone can do that. Yeah. And, I, and again... Well, is that a skill that people... Because listen... We, is, should, it, should it be? No, I no. don't know. What do, consumer, do consumers care about? It? I not, think consumers care the I, fact that you, okay. like, if they're going to reach. Let's, let, let's yeah. look at some numbers. So, Heather stands up on stage yeah. today. She does, goes to the NAR. I don't care what you think about the NAR buyer seller report. 3% yeah. of consumers said they cared about a blog. Yeah. Okay. 3%. I don't care how big the statistical variance is on that survey, 3% is almost zero. 3%, well, well let, me, let me respond to that. Because I, I, I absolutely disagree. With the fact that consumers are like, when you say define a blog, when it comes to making a decision about one realtor or another, the blog doesn't make a difference. No, I, I, I think I, I don't think we can make that statement because 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 Dave, because Dave, hold on hold on hold on go, because, go to, can, go can go to any respond. real estate let me, company. Let me, let me I don't care where it is in the United let me, States. Let me respond. You go, you walk randomly, walk into a real estate company. Is that because walk into a sales meeting yeah. and say, could the top producers please raise your hand? All right, now every single one of you who writes for a blog, keep your hand up. Is that every causation or correlation? doesn't matter. It does matter because here's the thing. We know consumers 
are searching online. The zero moment of truth. Google published that study saying people are looking for information. Because they there is no information that's actually worth reading, they're probably not looking at these damn blogs. Like if you go to a blog, it's like, here's why I'm the top agent in my area. Like, then like, then obviously they're not gonna find that information there. So I think the opportunity is, and I'm not sure if it's time. Okay. The opportunity, listen, I, I, I think Jeff's right, no, but I think the opportunity is actually delivering content people want to read.